in a short span of time, it was about 15, 20 minutes, we were uh, able to employ all the weapons from my aircraft and as well as I guided all the uh, weapons from my wingman's aircraft uh, while we were under this constant AAA fire and I believe we were fired upon approximately eight times by surface air missiles. And you took out that enemy position completely? We took the entire position out and uh, that night the Army took Baghdad International Airport. I am an infantry platoon leader in the New York Army National Guard and by saying three words to you today, I am gay, those three words are a violation of Title 10 of the U.S. Code. It's a code that's polluted by the people who want us to lie and basically they want us to lie about our identity and it's an immoral code and it goes up against every single thing that we were taught at West Point with our honor code. Thaddeus from Lansing, Michigan asks, is the new administration going to get rid of the don't ask, don't tell policy? That is, you don't hear a politician give a one word answer much, but it's yes. War does not stifle change, it demands it. It does not make change harder, it facilitates it. But I do not believe the stressors currently manifesting themselves in the lives of our troops and their families, lengthy deployments, suicides, and health care, are rendered insurmountable or any graver by this single policy change. In this past year alone, we've lost over 600 personnel. Uh, we need to keep all the best and brightest. And, and as you've covered in the past, we've lost you know 10 percent of our foreign language speakers in Arabic and Farsi, languages that we really need in fighting terrorism. We've also lost over 800 personnel in mission critical areas, meaning they cannot be easily replaced. Correct. If you could still serve, would you? Absolutely. I will be one of the first people, if not the first person, to go back in and, and there's no greater desire that I have right now to go back into the Air Force as an officer and a leader. Breaking news from Capitol Hill tonight where the House of Representatives is expected imminently to vote on an amendment to the defense authorization bill that would repeal don't ask don't tell pending Pentagon review. Today Defense Secretary Bob Gates announced changes to the way that don't ask don't tell will be implemented. Changes he said are designed to make the enforcement of the current policy more fair. Breaking news tonight from Riverside, California, where a federal judge, a U.S. District Court judge, has just declared the military's don't ask, don't tell policy to be unconstitutional. If you want to know anything about how this part of civil rights in America goes, if you want to know how don't ask, don't tell is going to get struck down by the courts and that's how it's probably going to die, what the court told Judge Layton was that he had to consider Margie Witt personally. I was aware of I wasn't going to tell, uh, they weren't supposed to ask me, but I really wasn't aware of that the third party could out me at any time. Unless you believe that the United States Senate, after this year's elections, is going to do the right thing by gay service members, ha, then the decision by the Obama administration whether or not to appeal this ruling is likely a decision between killing this policy now and letting it survive probably forever. The White House keeps saying they expect that the Senate is going to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell after the elections. I find that impossible to imagine. I think there's a lot of people around the country not exhaling until the end of this vote. Um, <laughs> right. This has felt like it was going to go away a lot of times before. Um, and it seems like it really is this time, but until that vote is called, uh, I think a lot of people will not, will not be Nebraska. breathing. Good evening. A landmark vote on Capitol Hill today appears to signal a new era in gay rights in this country while abolishing long-held military tradition and policy. Sometime this week, President Obama will sign the newly passed legislation that repeals the don't ask, don't tell policy. That means for the time being, gays and lesbians will be allowed to openly serve in the U.S. military. over and over again wrong. <laughs> it's done. Don't Ask, Don't Tell lived 17 years and now it shall be repealed. Joining us now are four of the reasons why it is being repealed. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Victor Fehrenbach, he is an F-15 fighter pilot facing discharge from the Air Force under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. After 19 and a half years of service, 
and multiple combat deployments to both Iraq and Afghanistan. He has been decorated with nine air medals, including one for heroism. Katie Miller, a former cadet sergeant at West Point, ranked ninth overall in her class of more than 1,100 West Point cadets due to graduate in the spring of 2012. Katie transferred out of West Point because of the compromise of her integrity due to living under the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. She now attends Yale University. Major Mike Almy, who was discharged from the Air Force under Don't Ask, Don't Tell after the military searched his private emails while he was serving in Iraq during the height of the insurgency in 2005. And Captain Jonathan Hopkins, a West Point graduate discharged from the Army after three combat deployments in both Iraq and Afghanistan where he earned three bronze stars, one with valor. These special live shows here this week are supposed to be about leadership, um, so I thought of you guys. Thanks for being here, you guys. down the line, your reaction um, to, to hearing this weekend that the, the Senate repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, finally happened. You saw this, this idiot on cable news there over and over and over again in that segment <laughs> saying it could definitely never happen in this way. How did you feel uh, when it finally did happen? Um, you know, the president told me over a year ago that he was going to get this done, and when he said it, I knew he was—he believed it. Um, to be honest with you, up till last Thursday or so, I—I I didn't believe it. I didn't think I would see this day until I was discharged or, or my retirement in September. Um, so it wasn't—it it wasn't until Thursday that I really believed it might happen. And then being there in the chamber, it still didn't hit me until actually I heard the vote of my senator from Ohio, Senator Voinovich, because there were talk there was talk of it being 60, 61 votes, and to have. I heard his voice give an eye, and uh, I knew we were over 62, and that's when it, when it really hit me. And I've still spent days here trying to grasp the gravity of it all. Um, so I don't, I don't know when that's going to sink in fully, but uh, it, was, it was an amazing day. I still keep thinking that I'm um, being wrong on television again. And that it hasn't <laughs> I like actually. That. I, like when I'm wrong. <laughs> I like when I'm wrong about stuff like this. <laughs> Katie, how did you feel? I was completely elated. Um, you know, there were times when I, I didn't think it was going to get repealed either. Um, and you know, especially after the, the first Senate vote, um, you know, I, I was at a pretty uh, all time low after that. Um, so when I heard the announcement, I was completely elated. And it, it's not just a good decision for LGBT ser service members, it's a, it's a good decision for the military as well. So I was, just, I was just exceedingly proud that our Congress people could do what was right. How about you, Mike? Overwhelmed. Three's a charm. We had two failed votes in the Senate and we got it right on the third attempt. And it's been such a roller coaster of emotions this past year. We've had some highs, we've had some lows. And uh, I was starting to doubt it was going to happen in the lame duck just because of the calendar. We were running out of time, but, but we did it. How about you, John? I'm excited for the that tens of thousands of people who are gay and in the service that they no longer have to go to work and feel like they're a criminal because they could get fired for just who they are. Um, I mean, I spent nine years in and knew the amount of pain that that caused. But secondly, I felt very, very proud for those uh, 65 senators that it's not too often that members of the Senate get to vote on something that really changes people, people's lives and reaffirms the certain, the very special American right to treat everyone the same. And made me very proud. Yeah, in, in you, um, actually, Jonathan and Katie, you both have, have written about and spoken about the, the toll that it takes from a person to live under a policy that makes you lie. Um, the stress, um, compromise to your integrity, as you wrote it in your resignation statement to West Point, um, depression, things that you wrote about, that you've written about um, since you were discharged. It's been, there, real harm has been done here to thousands of Americans, tens of thousands of Americans who have served under this policy. People who have lived through it, who have been done some harm, may be in this case right now, thinking about reenlisting, thinking about getting back in. Do any of you guys have advice for people given the damage that has been done? I, I would say look, look past it. it. There is so much good in the military. We, and I, I'm, I'm sure I speak for all of us here, as well as the other 14,000 that have been affected by this and thrown out. We do it because of love of country and, and for, for the people, the men and women that we serve with, the mission. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was absolutely horrible and destroyed my career and darn near destroyed my life. Um, and 
I, I come from a military family and I just absolutely cannot wait to resume my career as an officer and leader because I love my country. This is what I was called to do. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was just one small aspect of that, which obviously had a tremendous impact on my entire life and career, but that's over with now. And now, now the military needs positive role models of gay and lesbian officers and enlisted personnel serving openly, honestly, with full integrity, right beside their straight counterparts with zero detriment to the military. Something that I always said while I was part of the military and say it today is one thing that made me proudest about it is it makes everyone better. It doesn't matter if you come from a good family or bad family. When you go into the military, you have numerous moms and dads making you a better person, reinforcing certain values that make the military strong. Don't ask, don't tell was the one exception to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in amidst making everybody stronger, it destroyed party inside, and you couldn't talk to anybody about it. So, I mean, it's a wonderful organization, and it does so much for all of us. Um, people can go and do that proudly now. Victor, let me um, ask you, uh, just thinking about leadership, you initially decided, I know, that you weren't going to fight your discharge, that you wanted it over quietly and quickly, and you just wanted it done with. What made you change your mind and decide to, to stand up and be counted and fight it? There were actually a couple decision I, decision points I had to make there. Um, not to use that term, but <laughs> sorry, I apologize. Decision points. I think there's there. 13 specifically. Yeah. yeah. And you're right. I mean, initially, I I, I just I, I didn't want anyone to know. I wasn't out to my family. I wasn't out to any friends. I had just a few friends to rely on uh, that I could talk to. And Mike was one of them. As a matter of fact, the first person I told was Mike Almy um, about what I was going through. And I just I just wanted it to be quiet. I was gonna I I secured a job. I was gonna move on. Um, and th the first major decision point was. Um, you know, I was at the lowest low. I mean, where I wanted to, I wanted to quit a lot of things, including life. Um, then somebody said, "You need to hear this story about Major Margaret Witt in Washington. She just won a case. She fought, and she won a case. And this could apply to you somehow." And so read about that. And I did. And that was the first sign that I had of hope that somebody could actually fight and win. It was it was her will to fight to stick to it. Um, that that was the first major decision point. I remember I called Mike that day and I said, "Hey, do you think that this would be possible that if I could tell my story, maybe, and it would have an impact, and I could fight this and I could win?" Do you think that that's even possible? And all, Mike and all my friends said that's what we wanted to hear from you, not that you were going to give up and quit. So they had a, a lot to do with that. Um, there was another major point when we were, this was over a year later, I'd already been on the show and talked. Um, and there, it was coming up to a decision about the legal battle, um, whether we were going to take that on. Um, and so again, I always knew it was the right thing to do. And I just wondered if I had the, the courage to do it. And I wasn't sure about that. So. Uh, I was going to make the decision up to last Thanksgiving, and we were talking to some law firms about it. And one of my concerns was, how is this going to impact my personal life? You know, was it going to be invasive and, and sort of take all my privacy away? Um, so I talked to Margaret Witt about it again because she had been going through it. Um, and so I was about ready to make the decision, but that was a big concern for me and for my family. And I was sitting in my office one day, and. It was, the phone rings and I picked it up and it was an older gentleman and it's, he said he was in his 80s. He said he'd fought in the Korean War. He'd been in the military for 20 years and it was hard for him and he spent all that time and it was just so difficult and he said what you're doing, you're helping people that you don't even realize. You're not just helping young people, you're helping veterans like me that have spent my whole life hiding and lying and in the shadows. So he said you have to keep fighting for me and I was in tears in my office. I shut the door. And I called SLDN and I said, I'm in, we're doing this, I have to do this. <laughs> so, Katie, let me ask you, um, as the youngest person here and as the person who made this decision at the very beginning of your military career at your time at West Point, are you worried about the military's capacity to make this change? Uh, not in the slightest. Um, I, I mean, we have to take into account that, you know, gay or lesbian, uh, heterosexual, or um, it, it doesn't matter. We're, we're service members first. We're professionals. We follow the law. Um, and uh, the military is seeing much more radical transitions with the racial integration, the integration of women. And now we finally have um, a policy that, you know, 80% of the country supports, 70% of the service doesn't care one way or the other. Um, the military is going to implement this policy beautifully. I, I have no doubt about that. Lieutenant Colonel Victor Fahrenbach, Katie Miller, Major Mike Almey, Captain Jonathan Hopkins. Um, it's a real honor to have you guys here. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Congratulations. Thank you. As you uh, may be able to tell from that
that sound. Uh, this is a live broadcast in front of a big, beautiful audience at the 92nd Square Y in New York City. Uh, so much more to come this hour. Rolling Stone's Matt Taibbi is here to talk about shame and the Senate and the art of getting stuff done in politics. Lots to come. Please stay with us.